One of the most important set features of a time piano, such as a Fender Rhodes, is the strike line. But why is it so important? What is it? And what's the physics behind it? So I hope to cover some of that and ask some questions around it in this video. So a common method for setting up the strike line is moving the harp backwards and forwards while striking a key. At the correct position, the note will create the highest amplitude and it should create a pleasing sound at this point. Here's a clip of me setting my strike line. If we look at the audio, you can see the visual change in amplitude. It is quite significant. But what causes this? Why is the strike line so important? And why does it change the sound so much? I found that this point is one third along the tine, though you need to ignore the tapered section of the tine. So here's a tine that's been used. It measures 135 millimeters. So one third along is 45 millimeters. And at this point, we do have a dark spot of where the hammer has been repeatedly hitting the tine. So why is this location so important? Well, to understand this, I wish I had a high speed camera and we could look at that interaction in such detail, but I've got no Patreons and there's a way we can just slow the world down and that is to make a giant tine. So I've got some threaded rod and I'm just going to lock this into a vise. We can then hit this with various locations and see how the rod reacts. Just for reference, on the other end, I've put a pen and this represents the pickup. And the pickup only cares about the end of the tine. So the more the tine moves at the end is the more signal produced. I've got this rubber covered screwdriver and I'm just going to use that to tap along it to act as a hammer. If I hit the tine close to the vise, the beam is very stiff and there's almost no movement in the tine. The hammer bounces back at me. As I move slightly along, we start to get some more movement in the tine. But if we look carefully, we're actually not generating a fundamental note. There's an anti-node towards the end of the tine. And then since this node is close to the pickup, the motion is very small at the pickup. If I place my finger there, this can induce that mode shape a little clearer. But this is not ideal. Moving along, we can then see it to get a nice oscillation. And notice how much the end of the tine is now moving. And this has really excited the tine with a lot of energy. And we carry on moving down the tine. It becomes less and less stiff. So the hammer actually wants to move at a tine. It almost like saps and sticks to it. I can feel it actually double striking the tine as we move away. I think a good analogy is a football. I would like to think I could kick a football a good distance, but if that ball was heavier, such as a bowling ball, I'm not going to be able to achieve the same distance. And on the other end, if I had a really light ball, such as a balloon, I'm not going to be able to kick that as far as well. One third along the time seems to be about the correct position and generate the right stiffness for the maximum energy transfer. I was hoping to create a four minute to show this, but I've just not had time. Where it excites the easiest, I've added some tape and this does align with the one third guideline. This is a 90 centimeter long threaded bar and then 30 centimeters along is where the tape is. And this is where it switches from that node oscillation to a fundamental oscillation. I think there's a lot more to explore here, but for now, I think we've got an understanding of where the strike line needs to be. And I'll revisit this with a formula showing that the inertia balance happens at one third along. I do hope this has been interesting. And then until next time, please don't try and kick any bowling balls. <laughs>